Yes, I think Harold starts there. Hmm? I think Harold just started this. Oh, yeah. I guess. Yes. Yes. Are we ready to start? We've got to go. We're good to go? Okay. <laughs> Welcome to the Hudson Institute. My name is Harold Furch, Scott Roth, and I'm very honored to be able to uh, moderate this session today. Today, we're going to be talking about a topic that everyone is interested in, money. And we're very, very, very honored today to have two of the world's leading experts on money and monetary policy to speak with us. Brendan Brown and Alex Pollock will be discussing the road from perpetual inflation and bubbles to good money. Let me just tell you a bit about our speakers. Although they need no introduction, you know who they are and their wonderful backgrounds. But just for the record, let me just tell a little bit about our speakers. Brendan Brown is a senior research fellow at the Hudson Institute. He's also a senior fellow at the Mises Institute. He is a founding partner of Monetary Scenarios, publishing current viewpoints. Formerly, he was head of economic research at Mitsubishi UFJ Group in Europe. He continues as a contributor to Nikkei's Market Eye column. His postgraduate degrees in economics and finance include a PhD from the University of London, an MBA from the University of Chicago, and an MSc from the London School of Economics. He has published many books on money and finance, including both topical and historical. His most recent published book in October of 2022 was co-authored with Robert Pringle under the title, A Guide to Good Money. And we here at the Hudson Institute were very honored to have a book session with the authors of that, of that book. Alex J. Pollock is a senior fellow with the Mises Institute. His career has included being the principal deputy director of the Office of Financial Research to the US Treasury, a fellow at the American Enterprise Institute, and president and chief executive officer of the Federal Home Loan Bank of Chicago. Mr. Pollock focuses on financial policy issues, including financial systems, central banking, uncertainty and risk, and financial cycles. He is the author of Boom and Bust, Finance and Philosophy, Why We're Always Surprised, and co-author of Surprised Again, The COVID Crisis and the New Market Bubble, as well as numerous articles and congressional testimony. His work is available at alexjpollock.com. Our speakers today will discuss four topics. And in each of these topics, uh, Dr. Brown will begin with a discussion uh, followed uh, by Mr. Pollock, who will uh, end the discussion. Uh, each of these sessions will be about 10 minutes in those those topics will first be U.S. monetary problems, endemic or external. Second is a good U.S. money system at essential components. The third is U.S. money regime, dollar global role and geopolitics. And fourth, the way from bad U.S. money regime to good. I would ask the audience to hold your questions to the end. We want to be sure we get through the material. It's a wonderful presentation. Uh, and I'm sure you're going to have lots of questions, but let's hold them to the end. And with that, let me turn things over to Brendan Brown. Well, thank you very much for the lovely introduction, Harold. And I'm delighted to be here with my longtime friend and inspirator, um, Alex. And to take the first topic, U.S. monetary problems, endemic or external, the short answer is monetary problems are endemic. Um, and if we take the great pandemic inflation, which we've been living through, um, there's two ways of looking at this, one right and one wrong. The right one is to see this as a crescendo in malfunction of a deeply flawed monetary system. Um, the second way is to regard it as an unlucky episode in otherwise skilled monetary management. Um, now, why, why do we choose the first way of looking at it as a crescendo of malfunction in a deeply flawed monetary system? Because if we'd had a monetary system in the United States which had any solid uh, 
anchoring, meaning um, money, money based supply under some sort of quantitative restraint and uh, underlying strong demand for that monetary base, we wouldn't have seen anything like what has transpired, which is a almost cumulative rise of prices during a pandemic in the United States of 20%, a loss of purchasing power of 20%, and a virulent asset inflation. What you would have seen um, under a well-functioning monetary system where the overall constraints were very tight on the money supply growth, you would have seen a starting price rise reflecting the scarcity during the worst of a pandemic. And once the pandemic restraints began to ease, prices would have come down. And over the period as a whole, there wouldn't have been a cumulative rise in prices and there wouldn't have been a serious asset inflation. Um, so, and you wouldn't have had what has ineffectively been a gigantic raising of monetary taxation for the US government by the Federal Reserve. All of that has been the symptom of a highly flawed monetary regime, which we come on to discuss. How did we get into such a perilous type of monetary regime? And I would take as a starting point for that question, although one can obviously go back much further, the 1990s. If you think of that decade, we'd had the first attempt at monetary reform or monetary correction in, in the fiat US monetary system with the period of very tight money under Paul Volcker in the early 80s. But by the mid 80s, all of that was beginning to be frittered away due, due to the dollar devaluation and the plaza agreement, which the Federal Reserve participated in wholeheartedly. So that by the end of the 1980s, you'd had coming back a high inflation. And of course, a country where that was most virulent and serious was in Japan. That, that um, by the time we get to the early mid 1990s, that high inflation had been tackled. And there was a sort of calming in the economic waters, along with the glow of the IT revolution. And at that point, there could have been a serious monetary reform going back to improve on the monetarist experiment, which had been aborted so rudely during the plaza devaluation in the aftermath. Instead of that, under the Clinton administration and under the um, rule of Alan Greenspan at the Fed, we had a descent into what I've termed and other economists have termed as a 2% inflation standard. No, that implied no return to any sort of mon monetarism or monetary controls, but instead using the current vogue at that time of neo-Keynesian economics to try to steer monetary policy through the belief that central banks somehow had a, a divine insight into neutral interest rates <laughs> and a relationship between unemployment and inflation. Um, so what we have today is what one can term as a 2% inflation regime, which subsists very much as an emperor's new clothes story. It's, it's got no basis, no control mechanism other than this pretense that central bankers know these relationships, which of course nobody knows. But as long as everybody believes or thinks that they do know that, then somehow inflation is going to remain at this 2%. Well, all of that blew up, of course, during the pandemic. And that's where I invite Alex to come in with his response. Thanks very much, Brendan. And thank you for inviting me to join you uh, on, on this uh, event. I'll start off by saying Brendan re referred to the pretense. Of course, Hayek has a brilliant phrase uh, for the uh, pretending uh, that central banks know what they're doing, which is the pretense of knowledge. Uh, which he has tried to help us uh, 
see through, and I'll come back to that in, in later on in the program in different, uh, uh, a different part of my comments. Uh, I want to talk about the decisive moment uh, in, in this uh, monetary history uh, in the last uh, 100 years or so, which is uh, August 1971, the great asset inflations, consumer price inflations, and the recurrence of uh, crises about once every 10 years, and the fact that central banks have become committed to perpetual inflation, which means that prices never go down. They only go up uh, or maybe sideways for a while, but never a down, which is the opposite of, a, what, of what happens in a sound money or a, or a good money regime. Now, uh, in 1944, at the Bretton Woods Conference, uh, where the nations of the world very sensibly tried to figure out a monetary system going, going forward, and, and they did figure out one, the chief American negotiator at the Bretton Woods, Harry Dexter White, said gold and the U.S. dollar are synonymous. In 1944, that uh, was plausible. Uh, it's hardly plausible now. Uh, the dollar dropping in its value of gold from 135th of an ounce, uh, which it was from 1934 to 1971, to, as of last Friday, 1,970th 1, the of an ounce, which is a 98% depreciation uh, in terms of gold. Uh, I don't think we can overestimate the importance of the August 1971 uh, event in which under the, uh, the presidency of Richard Nixon, the old Bretton Woods gold connection was cut. The United States reneged or defaulted on its international commitments, which had been approved by the Congress in 1945, and put the entire world onto a pure fiat or paper or accounting currency system uh, with uh, very important results, the whole world. Now, it's interesting to me that at the time, this was intensely controversial, intensely controversial. And there was a great criticism of the United States for doing this, which, as you'll remember, perhaps, uh, evoked John Connolly, the then Secretary of the Treasury's response, that it's our currency, but it's your problem. Um, uh, but now, 50 years later, everybody accepts this pure fiat currency, pure paper currency system. Most people have trouble imagining that the whole world could be on any other system, that there could be a different monetary way of thinking, like Brendan tries to, uh, tries to get us to see. In short, um, we can say that we are all Nixonian, we speaking largely, most people, almost everybody, we are all Nixonians now when it comes to monetary policy. Uh, is there a way we're trying to explore, Brendan and I, to get to a better monetary system than that, one that won't have perpetual inflation, one in which prices do sometimes go down and therefore over long periods of time they're more stable on average uh, than we have now, where they only uh, go up, and where we don't have financial crises every 10 years. Under the 1971 system, we have had extraordinary instability in credit and, mon and money and uh, banking markets. We've had crises in the 1980s, very serious ones, 1990s, 2000s, uh, 2010s and now in the 2020s, so more or less uh, once a decade under this system in which central banks have become committed to perpetual inflation because 2% means 2% a year forever. Only sometimes, of course, it gets a lot worse than that. I recommend Brendan's book, The Case Against 2% Inflation. We should all study and to get ourselves out of this commitment uh, to perpetual uh, inflation at 2% or any other number is what we need to be working on. And it's time to stop all being Dixonians. Back to you, Brendan. <laughs>
Which comes on to the second topic we're going to discuss, a good US money system essential components. Um, and I mentioned earlier the failed and aborted Volcker at, uh, attempt at monetarism in the early 1980s. What can we learn from that? And I, th I think one of the key errors or areas we have to look at is it's not enough to talk of constraining the growth in the money supply, but you also have to have a strong and broad demand for monetary base in such a system, which incidentally we had under the gold regime where monetary base was gold. But the challenge here is to recreate that situation under a fiat regime. So I'd, I make a number of points which are going to be essential to a more thoughtful and successful monetarism type solution to what was briefly experimented with in the early 1980s. The first point I want to make is that a good money should be good for the individual. The idea of there's a trade-off where individuals have to accept a half good money for the benefit of society has no basis in any thoughtful review of this um, reform process. The better money is for the individual, the better the money is for society. Um, but what we have to look at as a, a key um, component of a good money is that it must have at its base a group of assets which have a quality of extreme moneyness and are very popular as such. So there's a broad demand for this monetary base. Um, and it must also be restricted. It, there must be a means of restricting its supply. Um, now, when you think of a fiat money regime, these extreme money type assets include reserves at the Federal Reserve, deposits at the Federal Reserve, and they include banknotes. And each of those have extreme moneyness. They can be used in immediate settlement. They, have, they are um, uh, instantly convertible into other assets. But what has happened um, under the actual regime, under the actual flawed regime, is that, first of all, these qualities have been diluted. And secondly, the restraint on their supply has become very, very weak, if there at all. And this comes on to my third point. A good money system has to have a solid anchor. What I mean by a solid anchor is a, 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 a device that's going to prevent money getting out of control, that's going to prevent goods and services inflation, and is going to prevent asset inflation. And the key insight I'm trying to give you here in what I've written is that a solid anchor has to be based on some combination of restricting supply of this monetary base at the same time as making sure that this monetary base enjoys a broad and stable demand. Now, it's critical in this that we always have a monetary base scarce. It must always be scarce, so scarce that people want to hold a large amount, even although it pays no interest. Um, so that's an absolutely key point in a reform process. How do we uh, sustain the and, and build on the quality of this monetary base that people want to hold and also restrict its supply. And this must be at zero interest. 
you're, I'm sure most of you are aware that in 2008, what the Federal Reserve started paying interest on reserve deposits at the Fed. That was an absolutely um, devastating step in terms of any idea of achieving monetary stability. Because once you pay interest on reserve deposits, a number of things follow from that. First of all, you lose all possibility of a free market and interest rates. The interest rate in the money market becomes what the Federal Reserve dictates the rate should be. Um, and then secondly, when you pay interest on reserves at the market rate, you have a, a very large um, demand for reserves. Reserves deposits, in fact, become just like any other financial asset. People will hold much more of this reserve deposit than what they actually would hold for the purpose of obtaining any sort of high quality monetary services. It becomes a financial asset. So once you move to this payment of interest at the policy rate on reserve deposits, not only have you diluted completely the, mon the qualities of the monetary base, but you've also undermined completely the restrictiveness of the supply on, uh, of, of a monetary base. So you've, 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 you're, you're left with uh, any system of monetary control being highly arbitrary and based on rate, rate manipulation rather than anything to do with money. And I would, I, would, I would say that in the present regime, you don't, in fact, have monetary policy. What you have is interest rate policy. You have the Federal Reserve and, of course, foreign central banks constantly deciding how, what steps they're going to take in changing the interest rate. Um, but money, as such, is no longer operating to control the system. In, in the way that it would under a, either a classic monetary system or under a, a classic gold system. Um, I come on to point uh, two further points which typify, in fact, three further points that typify a good money system. One is that you have to have a fully competitive financial system. That means that the banks and, of course, non-banks are competing on an equal basis to produce deposits or money deposits that the public want. And they, are, uh, they compete to produce safe deposits. Safe deposits do not depend on a deposit insurance corporation or on lender of last resort. Under a competitive financial regime, safe deposits are manufactured by banks holding a large element of reserves against them. And these reserves, uh, their demand for reserves to back these deposits are a fundamental part of the anchoring of the monetary system. Second point I would make, in an ideal or, or a good US monetary system, there should be a natural rhythm of prices. It's actually abhorrent to see the ideal under the present regime of prices rising at 2% per annum. In a, in a well-functioning capitalist, free market capitalist system with a stable money, you would expect prices to move up and down persistently over considerable periods of time, consistent with the long-run um, ambition or, or promise that there's going to be uh, main, uh, money is not going to seriously lose its purchasing power over the very long run. But that's a very long run statement. In the short and medium term, prices fluctuate both up and down. And that's very important for the way an economy works. I'll, I'll give you two or three examples of that. In a, in a recession, if you have a well-functioning price system with a stable money, yes, prices should fall to below where they are on average over the business cycle as a whole. And that fall in prices to a lower level during the recession 
together with the expectation that they're going to be at a higher price during the boom period or when conditions return to normal, plays a very important, important part in stabilizing the economy. These intertemporal fluctuations in prices are intrinsic to how a capitalist system rebalances itself. Now, if you take the example of a famine, or the nearest thing to a famine being the pandemic, in a well-functioning monetary system, what would happen would be that the prices would rise during the peak period of famine, but everyone would know that under this well-functioning monetary system, prices would be falling back in the longer term. So in response to the high prices now, people would delay consumption, not bring it forward, as actually happened during a pandemic when you had a consumer spending boom, they would see that the likelihood would, the prices would be lower at the end of this temporary shortage, and they would delay consumption, exactly the opposite of what happened. And that's how, uh, well, so instead of uh, inflation expectations being built up, I mean, and what, what happened in many ways is, is, is crazy from a perception of any um, monetary stability, that during... What, what we had is the Federal Reserve saying that we don't know what inflation is going to be during the pandemic. We don't know how steep the price rise is going to be, but we do promise you that at some stage in the future, we're going to reach the promised land of a new gently sloping upward plateau for prices. But we don't know where that peak, where the new plateau is going to be starting from. That is absolutely no relationship to what should be the situation under a well-performing monetary system where you would, uh, you would see the present price rise as an aberration which would be corrected back down in the future. Um, and the final point I make about this good money regime is a free market in interest rates. You, you know, when you look at the bond market today or long-term interest rates, or every, every, everything is speculation about what inflation is going to be and what the Fed's going to be doing. Um, but if you cast your mind to how a free market in interest rates would work under a stable money regime, the long-term interest rate would have nothing to do with what the Fed's doing or inflation because the prices in the long run would be returned to some stable level. Um, they would be determined wholly by millions or billions of individual decision makings as to saving and investment and, and um, the in, their individual circumstances. Short-term interest rates in the money market would be determined completely by the supply and demand in the overnight money markets in which reserves pay no interest. Thank you. So you can see how radical Brendan is compared to current thinking. Think about these two statements. Should prices go up forever and never go down? That's the current orthodoxy. Or should prices sometimes go down and sometimes go up and on average be more or less flat? Uh, those are two wildly different uh, views. And what is orthodox and what is radical has flipped uh, in time. Um, the, the sound money school um, um, for, uh, for Brendan and me would say prices could go down as well as up over time. And over time, the goal wouldn't be perpetual inflation, uh, just, uh, just the opposite. And the other thing is uh, underlying the notion that the Federal Reserve should be manipulating interest rates all, uh, all the time is the actually astonishing assumption, if you think about it, astonishing assumption that a committee of economists knows what the interest rate should be. Like, that's clearly wrong. They, they don't know what the interest rate should be. They don't know what it will be. They don't know what it should be. And the whole reason you have a market is to discover prices, uh, not to have them mandated by a committee uh, in Washington. All right, so let me think about what the Federal Reserve Act says. The original Federal Reserve Act doesn't say anything about inflation or, or how the Federal Reserve should control inflation because it was enacted under the gold standard, uh, still in place in 1913. And indeed, the first mention of the Federal Reserve uh, 
targeting inflation was in 1977, which is the Federal Reserve Reform Act of 1977. I think we need a Federal Reserve Reform Act of 20, uh, let's be optimistic, of 2023 uh, or 2024. Uh, but what the, uh, what the amendment of 1977 says, bringing in inflation for the first time, is <coughs> the goal of the Federal Reserve should be prices, stable prices, stable prices, not price stability. That's a term that's invented later by the Fed itself. Stable prices. Well, what do stable prices mean? Well, that's pretty obvious. It means, on average, <coughs> excuse me, prices are going more or less sideways, which is completely different from the new speak idea of price stability, which is prices rise forever at 2% a year. Now, uh, let's do a little math. Uh, at 2% a year in one lifetime of, let's say, 80 years, how much does the average price change? How much does the consumer price index rise? And the answer is more or less five times. So prices quintuple in an average lifetime. At 2%, that's just 1.02 to the 80th power. Uh, that's hardly a stable price. Now, occasionally these days, uh, since we get used to 2%, people say, well, why not 3 or 4%? So what happens in an average lifetime if prices are rising at 3% a year? The answer is prices go up by 11 times, 11x in the course of your lifetime. Uh, three doesn't sound a lot more than two, but it's enormously much more than two. How about four? 1.04 to the 80th power is basically 23. So if you like 4%, you like prices in your life 23 times higher and the absolute destruction uh, of the value of your savings and of your money. So let's ask quickly, uh, who made the decision to have perpetual inflation at 2%? The Federal Reserve itself, unilaterally, based heavily on arguments made uh, in the 1990s by Janet Yellen, then a governor, of course, later chairman of the Fed and now secretary of the Treasury, that people can be relied upon to suffer from money illusion. That is to say, they're misled by nominal money values. They don't look at inflation uh, values. That might be true in a sound money system where every inflation is temporary, then maybe during the temporary inflation, you could have money illusion. But if you have perpetual inflation, at least in my judgment, money illusion is highly uh, unlikely on anybody's part. The other part is a Keynesian argument, which is you have inflation to reduce real wages. You won't ever find this among the Fed's statements, but that's the central banking theory. You inflate, you have to have international adjustments, you inflate to reduce real wages, uh, and therefore you become more competitive. Again, that, you can make that argument, as Keynes would have, for a temporary inflation, but not for a perpetual inflation. Uh, in my judgment, that doesn't make sense. Now, the Fed committed the United States to perpetual inflation at 2% a year, or prices quintupling in the average lifetime, as a unilateral decision. This is also amazing when you think about it, that they had the, the audacity or the arrogance to proclaim that on their own they could commit the country to this. It, to, as far as I know, and Brendan may be able to correct me, every other country that has an inflation target, the target is an agreement between the government and the central bank. It's not a unilateral act of the central bank. A 2% inflation goes back to New Zealand. There it was invented. It was invented, as you'll learn from Brendan's book when you read it, it was invented to get inflation down, not to get inflation up to 2%, to get it down to 2%. The original goal was 0 to 2%, and it was set up as an informal agreement between the cabinet, that is to say, that the elected government in parliament, and the central bank, and so on in other countries. I think it's an amazing thing in our own country that we had this uh, very undemocratic uh, 
uh, as I say, uh, arrogant, in my view, action by the Federal Reserve to assume that they could on their own commit the country to perpetual inflation, that is to say, to non, non-sound money uh, or non-good money. Now, we know governments like inflation because it's a slow uh, uh, default, an implicit default on government debt. Uh, and we know that that's always popular uh, with governments because once you run up your debt, you have to get out of it somehow. But there is no excuse in my mind uh, for, for the, the vast question of money, a huge social good, to be decided by a committee of unelected central bankers as opposed to a democratic uh, decision involving the Congress. Brandon. I'm going to just shift gear a bit here to a statement I think uh, Alex referred to obliquely, which is the um, Nixon's Treasury Secretary in the early 70s saying that the dollar is uh, US's currency, but everyone else's problem. That is, uh, I, I, I don't want to uh, pick one statement in isolation, but it, it, uh, that must be one of the most irritating statements to anyone who thinks seriously about the US's role in geopolitics, that US gains fundamentally in geopolitical position from a strong good currency rather from a weak currency. And I'm just going to give you a few examples of how the US and the global geopolitical system, peace, prosperity, freedom, have suffered from a bad US currency. And I want to make the starting comment that US dollar enjoys a tremendous hegemony in the the world despite being a bad money. Um, and that is for one of two reasons. One, one being that for foreign countries to take a different path from an inflationary hegemon creates lots of problems in that economy, particularly their export sectors. But also, for, for much of the time, their governments have similar interests to U.S. government in, in a bad money. Big governments everywhere gain from a bad money. And we're very glad to take the lead from a U.S. government somehow having a bad money. Um, now, if we think of, and I'm, I'm going to give you three or four countries' examples which have been affected by a bad money to the disadvantage um, of the global situation. If Germany and Europe had not been following the U.S. bad money through the, last, through, through the first and second decade of this century, but in, in, instead had had the opportunity of following a good U.S. money, um, Germany would not, we would not have had the European monetary crisis and banking crisis and everything else, but what, which was part of the global financial crisis in 2008-2009. That, that, that event um, severely weakened not just Western Europe, but most of all the position of Germany, which essentially became highly burdened with the whole commitment of um, responsibility for the rest of European Monetary Union. As a result, in terms of defense and its geopolitical role, Germany was way below had much less influence and power than it would have done if it, in fact, had been in a powerful, prosperous Europe. And I think we can argue in another day that the results of that in Germany and its relationship with the United States and on the other side of the coin, the increased importance of Eastern Europe and US policy has had some fairly unfortunate results. Um, Secondly, when we look at Japan, I think without any question, the fact that the US was following, I mentioned earlier in the talk how, how the Japanese economy was the main sufferer from the US monetary inflation in the late, in the post-plaza period. 
Then we come on to the low interest monetary inflation periods of the first two decades of, of this century, which played into the um, uh, enabling the RB government to pursue its big government policies, in the zero negative interest rates. Um, so, the, so the yen, in fact, became extinct as an international money. I, I would argue that if the, if the yen had actually been related to a strong, super uh, good US currency, the, the yen could have been something like uh, the Deutsche Mark was in the 1970s in Asia, and something that actually was a vehicle of, of um, U.S. and um, a, a freer influence in the Asian area than what we had. And that comes on to China, where the perpetually low or negative real interest rates in inflating dollar has meant, has, has an, in fact enabled the Chinese regime to continue with highly restrictive capital exports because many and, and pursue credit inflation policies because the, the um, option of fleeing has been so much less attractive into a, a defective US currency. Um, and there's more examples of that that I would give, but I, uh, and I pass on to um, Alex at this point. Uh, thanks, Brendan. Uh, we want to move to uh, as Brendan has begun already, the intertwining of geopolitics with monetary systems. When you think about it, it makes complete sense. Domestically, we know that monetary power and political power go together, and the same is true internationally. And here we are at the Hudson Institute, and every time I walk in the front door out there and see the picture of Herman Kahn, who I had the great pleasure of meeting, uh, many years ago, and think about his uh, his uh, profound uh, geopolitical thinking. I think he would he would approve of this section we're about to talk about with with monetary policy. I uh, I quoted before gold and the U.S. dollar are, sumo, are synonymous. Harry Dexter White. At that point, the Bretton Woods Agreement was a uh, contest between Britain and the United States between Keynes who was there, and Harry Dexter White, basically, about what the outcome would be. Well, where, what was the situation of Britain? Britain was broke. By winning two world wars, they had make, made themselves completely insolvent as a government. And they had gone from not only the hegemon of the world, with the British Navy and Empire, and the Bank of England, and the pound sterling, as the uh, world currency uh, to basically the status of a beggar <coughs> from the US for, for financial support. The result was, <coughs> excuse me, of uh, Bretton Woods was a, a US monetary hegemony that went along with and supported the military role that was uh, um, that was developing after the Second World War uh, based on US uh, military uh, capacity. And one of the ways to uh, think about this uh, is to think that there's a kind of a deal here. If the rest of the world finances the US through holding dollars by making the dollar the uh, international money, good or bad, uh, that helps finance the military umbrella that the US was providing and is providing for countries all over the world. I think you can think of this as a, as a kind of fair deal. So what the French famously called an exorbitant privilege of having the dollar be the reserve currency could, instead of an exorbitant privilege, be seen as a sharing of the burden of financing the geopolitical role and the world military uh, um, strategies, again, uh, tipping our hat to Herman Kahn, uh, of the U.S. And, and, the, and the countries going along with the dollar-based system, that being a fair deal in exchange uh, for the U.S. Uh, military protection. And this is, is an element that I think is hardly ever touched on uh, 
in monetary debates, but, uh, but enormously important. Well, is there, and now thinking about that, is there an alternative to the dollar? That's a debate uh, often had, uh, and most people say no. Uh, and I think the answer is no, that there isn't an alternative uh, to the dollar. But that doesn't mean that there isn't an alternative to the Nixonian dollar. You would have a sounder, better dollar along the lines that Brendan and I are suggesting, which is, uh, which is the world currency. Brendan. I'm talking about world currencies. Uh, the final comment I th which we look at is how to get from a bad US money regime to a good. And obviously, that stretches way beyond today's meeting. But I would say if the first two or three steps that are essential to US monetary reform in that direction is, first of all, reversing the 2008 decision to pay interest on deposits at the Federal Reserve. Secondly, to move to a definite um, very low rate of expansion on the supply of those reserves, um, having uh, freeing up interest rates from being um, pegged by the Federal Reserve, um, and uh, also scrapping all deflation phobia, that is eliminating the 2% inflation target and accepting that we have periods of pri prices falling as well as rising. Well, Brendan has come back to the Federal Reserve Reform Act or, or its equivalent uh, coming along, and I do think there is that uh, necessarily to be uh, thought about. Uh, the first is an, uh, the revolution is an intellectual revolution, no longer believing in the pretense of knowledge uh, displayed by not only the Fed, but all central banks. Central banking really became a popular worldwide movement in the 1920s and later. For, for example, Canada didn't have a central bank till the 1930s. Um, and along with it has come this, this pretense of knowledge, but we know it's a pretending to know things that no one knows, and in fact, no one a can know. So I'm going to suggest a few, a few things here about uh, central banking, but in particular for this country, the leading country in the world with the, with the world's dominant uh, currency, um, in spite of the fact of its 98% depreciation against gold since, uh, since Bretton Woods. Uh, what, what could be done? First of all, think about the pretense of knowledge we, we are all very aware that the Fed's forecasts of inflation in recent couple of years have been pathetically wrong. Their forecasts of interest rates, which they're presumably controlling, have been completely wrong. In, um, in June 2021, forecasting for the end of 2022, the Federal Reserve forecast a federal funds target for end of 2022 Anybody know? 25 basis points was the median forecast. Uh, for 2023, at that time, they were forecasting 1.75%. These, these uh, forecasts were off by huge orders of magnitude. Uh, we also know, of course, all not only the Fed, but all of the regulators completely missed the banking turmoil and the runs and, and, and uh, banking failures of this year, 2023. So that's three strikes. Uh, I like to say, if you remember the famous poem about mighty Casey has struck out, that's three strikes. Another good example of this is the Fed's own uh, financial performance. Anybody know uh, how much money in the last uh, eight months the Fed Reserve has lost? The answer is $70 billion. Since September last year, in operating losses, the Fed has lost $70 billion. That's an annual rate, if you just count from December to now, the annual rate of their loss is over $100 billion a year, about $110 billion a year. That's a number which could get your attention, and would get my attention, $100 billion a year. Did they intend, were they managing their balance sheet uh, 
on purpose to lose $110 billion a year? I really doubt it. Um, on top of that, there are the mark to market on the Fed's own balance sheet, which has embedded in it a $5 trillion investing long versus borrowing short position is negative $900 uh, billion. And, and one way to think of the Fed is that it made its own balance sheet into the world's biggest savings and loan, and it's now reaping the consequent losses. So I only mention this as an example of if you don't think that was done on purpose, it is a, re is a way of underlining uh, the lack uh, of knowledge which characterizes us all uh, when it comes to the financial future. And uh, Harold was nice enough to mention the subtitle of one of my books, Why We're Always Surprised in Finance and Why the Central Banks Are Also Always Surprised. Well, what, what could we do? And here is a quick list of things which would be in my uh, 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 Federal Reserve Reform Act of the 21st century. And I agree with Brendan about the moving, uh, moving to a non-interest bearing uh, base uh, currency or anchoring about free markets in interest rates, which no one can know what they should be. But in addition to that, as I mentioned before, I think there needs to be a re uh, assertion of, of constitutional checks and balances when it comes to the Federal Reserve. The expressed powers of the Congress are clear and unquestionable when it comes to money, to coin money and regulate the value thereof, and anything that has to do with setting the strategy for the role of money in this economy. Uh, I remind you, uh, Something over 100 years ago, he had presidential elections fought on the money question uh, with William Jennings Bryan. These are, these are real, important, real and extremely important public issues, and the Congress uh, needs to be involved. Uh, I'd make the Fed keep their books on gap accounting, uh, on generally accepted accounting. They don't, you know. They make up their own accounting, and they hide uh, their losses. Um, we have other littler things like preventing the Fed from funding the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau, which makes no sense, especially when they're losing money. Uh, I would require the Fed to reduce its mortgages. Why is the Fed subsidizing mortgages and wanting to subsidize the housing market? That is a fundamental distortion, which shouldn't be allowed. I think they're their uh, uh, investment in mortgages should go back to zero, where it always was from 1913 to 2008. We had an aberration which needs to be corrected. Uh, I think uh, we need to change our public accounting, where the Fed's losses are counted as part of the deficit of the United States, which they are, but they're not accounted for in that way. And finally, I, to get all this done, uh, I suggest that the Congress should form new subcommittees of both the Senate Banking Committee and the House Financial Services Committee um, with the sole responsibility of overseeing the Federal Reserve. There's no more important financial operation than the Federal Reserve and the money and the unsound money it has created. Uh, and to try to get it back to a sound or good money basis is, is a hugely important topic. Uh, so they need, should have subcommittees whose only job is overseeing the Federal Reserve and understanding what it's doing and maybe asking them why they're losing $100 billion a year and what about sound money. And then, of course, the first thing those subcommittees should do is ask Brendan to come in and testify. And thank you for having me. Brendan. Thank you. Well, Brendan, Alex, thank you for a wonderful presentation. Uh, I would, um, uh, as the moderator, I actually have a couple of questions I'd like to ask, but, but let me first see if there are questions uh, from the audience that uh, would like to ask Brendan and Alex a question while we have them here. We have a 
Thank you. I'd like to um, uh, uh, hone in on the question of uh, dollar hegemony. You both indicated that even though the, we have a bad currency, you don't really see much of a threat from foreign currencies to the um, dominance of the United States dollar. As anybody who's ever worked for Treasury or the Fed knows, um, protecting the dollar is not stated in anybody's charter, but it's still one of the principal functions of both, uh, of both institutions. Um, yet to me, it seems that the dollar has never been under as much threat. Um, due to dollar weaponization, we start out with a hostility to the dollar by criminals who uh, are afraid that they'll be sanctioned, which spreads to our uh, geopolitical enemies, including um, Russia, China, Iran, Venezuela, North Korea. But now it's sort of spread uh, more broadly into the third world. You see the Brazilians expressing concern that we will impose sanctions on them because of uh, our, a failure to follow um, woke um, climate policies in the Amazon. You see the Saudis uh, opening up uh, purchases in, uh, of, of, of oil and OPEC uh, to currencies like the yuan and other currencies. You see the so-called BRICS nations talking about um, liking to see the end of dollar hegemony. It seems that there's more dissatisfaction with the dollar than any. And I know uh, the BIS, uh, the most recent numbers I've seen still say that 88% or so of international transactions uh, occur in the US dollar. But um, I'm starting to be concerned, and I wondered what uh, you gentlemen had to say about that. I mean, my immediate, res my immediate response to you would be you have to separate private um, satisfaction with the dollar and looking for alternatives from government and central banks. And of course, for, there, has been the, 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 there has been a defiance of bad US money that took place in the 1970s with Germany and the Deutsche Mark. Um, it's a question for another day why we haven't had any defiance since the 1970s and why the European Monetary Union failed to produce any defiance to the bad US money or why Japan is never defied. These, these are all, I wouldn't rule out these possibilities forever and forever. I can imagine situations where that would take place. Or, the, 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 or where even if you were being particularly fanciful one day, one of those countries, whether Europe or Japan, might adopt some gold-based system. But that's all, that's all well beyond probably the time profile we're thinking in terms of. Uh, uh, one thing you didn't mention, uh, Howard, and Howard's a good friend and co-author uh, of mine, is there has been a, a movement among central banks to holding more gold of recently, which is also in sort of an anti-dollar uh, movement. There's, of course, one major central bank that owns zero gold, not one ounce, which is the Federal Reserve itself. Uh, so whereas other central banks have potential revaluation gains uh, on their gold reserves, we, we don't. And that's one more sign there. But it still is the case the dollar seems to be maintaining its, its leading role. I, I would like to see it keep that role. Uh, but I would like to see it be a stronger, sounder, better dollar as it does that. Yep. Chris? Uh, Harold is oh, Harold is speaking. Harold, we can't hear you. And Brendan and I can't see him either. <laughs> OK, sorry about that. I, I said, let's see if we can squeeze in one more question from the audience, and let's uh, uh, please identify yourself uh, when asking the question and try to keep the question brief. Chris Demuth, Hudson Institute. I want to begin with Brendan's opening point that we have now a bad monetary regime, that the problems we've seen since the pandemic, inflation, the bank failures, and so forth, they aren't just bumps in the road. They're an inflection point. A bad system is becoming it's, it is becoming worse. And I, I think it's sort of implicit in both of your presentations uh, that, um, uh, that this bad system goes back to, I'll say, 1970. I'm, I'm not going to argue the point, but you both noted uh, taking the US off the gold, uh, the internet, closing the international gold uh, window uh, in 71 was an important point. So we might say that before 1970, just taking America as an example, we didn't have 
perfect monetary policy, but it wasn't, you know, it was good enough for government work. There were, you know, good periods, <laughs> bad periods, uh, but since 1970, things just seem to be getting worse and worse and worse, and we have all these little points along the way, adopting an official 2% uh, inflation standard, uh, this new normal of every decade, we have a major uh, financial crisis and so forth. I'd like to ask you to speculate, why did this happen? How did it happen? Um, I'm, I'm going to give you three uh, one-sentence theories uh, for why this happened. I'm not advocating them, but I'm trying to think of what the reasons are. One is, 1970 was also the beginning of our period of normalized deficits, leading to greater and greater public debt. Before that, we had a balanced budget. We, you know, we borrowed for wars, we borrowed for crises, we tried to pay it back, we paid it back out of economic growth, but we did not, but it was in the early Nixon years when they were first grappling with the fact, they thought they were gonna have this big surplus problem, they saw that they were gonna have permanent deficits. So it could be that this bad monetary policy has been an accommodation to the routinization of deficit spending and ever-growing debt. Uh, the second is that the financial sector has grown so big and mighty and important, and there was this mechanism where the government could actually fuse itself to the, this growing, important, wealthy part of the economy, <laughs> which was highly discretionary monetary policy, where it had on a day-to-day -day basis life or death power over all of the big financial actors, and it could insinuate self, it, it, in itself uh, into the financial sector in a way that had never been possible before. The third is the abandonment in all of our public life and culture of the idea of constraint. There used to be this idea that there were constraints in life, and in monet we had the gold standard, and we had constitutional restrictions on what the federal government could do. We had this implicit balanced budget rule. Um, we had uh, poetry that rhymes and goes in rhythm. And you know, in recent decades, the whole, you know, modernism consists of sweeping away restraints. And in government, it consists of centralizing power in Washington um, without any, uh, quote, arbitrary constraints. We just trust upon uh, the wisdom and absence of corruption of people holding a great deal of power. So we don't have a budget rule, we don't have a gold standard, we just have these guys and gals uh, making decisions, um, and we just think that the unconstrained human intellect uh, is better than these arbitrary constraints. So I'm just throwing those, I'm trying to think, how did this happen? And uh, those are, you know, those are three suspects, but you guys actually know what you're talking I about. Think, so uh, maybe uh, you would know. I think for all wonderful points you're, you're making, Chris, but I, I, I would, maybe to be devil's advocate, I would go back one stage further and say one has to give some considerable role to accident, accident or, of history and personalities. And I think for, for the eruption of the First World War and the end of the gold standard, which effectively took place in July 1914, was not just a catastrophic, well, it was the, first of all, was a catast catastrophic event for humanity, but it was certainly a catastrophic event for the monetary money going forward. And, and that's a view very much that was taken by a partner in one of the books I wrote, Philip Simino, that that was a bit like coming out of a Garden of Eden as regards monetary <laughs> systems. Um, and then on top of that, I would put the, the, the particular individuals. We had this growing inflation in the 1960s what prompted Nixon and his entourage. And the third, the third point I was just mentioned is you mentioned big government. Certainly big government is, 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 is the biggest gainer from bad money. But you also, I think we also have to consider big tech, big finance, big private equity. There's a lot of hangers on there who are doing very well out, out of bad money, thank you. And, and it's, in, in, if we think of a Metternich allegory, how do, how, do you, how do you displace the metanics of a modern mon monetary system when so many are doing so well? That, that is a challenge. I, say I thought your comments were brilliant, uh, Chris, and well, uh, well worth taking up uh, to have a, at least as a theory of the explanation of all this. 
uh, certainly is one. One is the movement, as, as you said and as Brendan touched on as well, from what was always a war financing idea in the history of money. Uh, Bank of England went off gold in 1797 to finance the wars against Napoleon. But, but then they thought they had to go back on gold 20 years later when the inflation got out of hand. Uh, that was, it was always a war financing technique. And then through, I think that 71 date is, is really key, it became a technique in general. What used to be thought of as temporary war finance, printing to finance the war, after which you corrected back with just uh, uh, a continuing uh, financing of government spending. And as I said, then, then the, <clears throat> the unsound or the bad money becomes a slow, uh, uh, implicit default on all the debt that's built up over time. Because you're still having to deal with the de debt. You're just dealing with it in a different way uh, by taxing through unlegislated taxes, that is to say inflation, uh, by carried out by the partnership of the central bank and the spending government. And, and that's such a big topic, we have, to, uh, we have to take it up some more. Well, thank you very much. I promised Brendan and Alex we would try to wrap this up around an hour. I know there are a lot more questions, and I have questions as well. But uh, let me suggest that uh, let's begin by giving Brendan and Alex a big round of applause. And then for those of you in the in-person audience, uh, please feel free to come up to them afterwards and uh, discuss, discuss your questions with them. But uh, first of all, thank you very much to Alex and Brendan.